On today's Join Us in France, a great day trip idea from either Toulouse or Carcassonne. Join us in France, episode 156. Bonjour, I'm Annie, and today I bring you a conversation with Elise on a lovely day trip that you can take, starting either from Toulouse or from Carcassonne, taking you to the small, cute village of Sorez and Revel, plus the lake of saint Ferréol, which is not my favorite place in the world, as you will see in this episode. Our next Paris tour is scheduled for October 1st through October 7th, 2017. We would love to have you join us in France, not only through the podcast, but also in real life. Check it out on addictedtofrance.com. For show notes on this episode, go to joinusinfrance.com forward slash 156, the number 156, or look at your podcast app. All podcast apps display the show notes one way or the other, but they don't all do it the same way, which is kind of a pain, but that's how it goes. Stick around at the end of my conversation with Elise to hear my personal update, as well as my thanks for people who support the show. Happy 4th of July, American listeners, and to Canadian listeners, congratulations on a wonderful 150 years of Canada. Joyeux anniversaire au Canada! And at the very end of the episode, after the closing music and everything, I had to ask Elise what her very favorite restaurant was during the inaugural tour in Paris. <laughs> This is Jonas in France, episode 156. Oh, my goodness. Bonjour, I'm Annie. And I'm Elise. And today we are talking about a nice outing that you can do either from Toulouse or, or from Carcassonne. From Carcassonne, depending on where you are staying. Staying, yes. Right, and it's a wonderful, wonderful full day's outing. And uh, since it's, uh, I'm trying to promote the idea that more and more people come and spend a few days in Toulouse and uh, circle out from there, you know, and do day trips going in lots of different directions. Yeah. Uh, this is one that is really lovely. Uh, something I do actually um, on a really more or less regular basis. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a great thing to do. I'd say the only time of the year that it might not be such a great thing to do is in the dead of the winter. But then again, there is not much dead of winter in Toulouse anymore <laughs> anyway. Uh, but what it is, is, is it's a trip uh, up into, it's actually, um, I, I always have a strange sense in my mind of what I think is the direction where things are. And then I find that I'm wrong when I look at a map. So <laughs> it turns out that this is basically going east and slightly southeast, believe it or not, uh, of Toulouse. So it is actually in the direction as oh, if you were going to Carcassonne, but yeah. it's, but it's north of, of Carcassonne. Okay. And what it is, is a, a, it's a day's outing that takes you to two lovely little, well, one is a village directly, really a village. And the other is a small town. And the village is the village of Sorez. And the little town is the town of Revel. And they are very, very close to one another. There are I say Revel. Re you said Revel. No, re Revel. Re R-E-V-E-L. Oh, -E yeah. C'est Revel. Revel. C'est Revel, pas Revel. 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 Re. No, Re. 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 Revel. Ravel. I like Ravel. I like Ravel. Okay, uh, you can say it any way you like, uh, but you're wrong. I'm wrong. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, uh, the, 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 the two towns are actually just about a couple of miles apart. 
And uh, from there, uh, go to a place that I love and that you are going to have to come back to so that you can see how wonderful it is. I had and, a bad uh, experience as a kid. Yeah, I think that, that that's why we have to get you past that one. It, uh, it is a place called uh, the, the Lake of Saint-Ferriol. And uh, uh, they're all grouped together. They're very, very close to one another. And yeah. it makes for a very lovely day's yeah. outing. Yeah, um, And I have to say, Elise is not somebody, you're not a homebody. No. So lots of people, they like me. Uh, after a month like I've had, I'm happy to stay home. Yeah. I actually enjoy when I look at my calendar and there's not much going on. I'm like, ah, at least it's not like that at all. No. <laughs> at no. least it's like. Okay, what can I do? What can I do? What can I go visit? What can I do? (laughs) Yeah. One day a week. I'm good. I'm good. One (laughs) home, one day a week. That's about, that's That's, what I like. That's that's, that's it. That's it. After the the second day, if it's two days in a row, I go. At least needs uh, surgery on her back. And you know why she doesn't want to do it? Because she's going to have to stay home too long. uh, To recuperate. uh, (laughs) No way. No way. (laughs) Anyway. Anyway. uh, so, So what are we talking about? We're talking about going into... Uh, an area that uh, actually we we go into two zones really. Uh, one is a region called the Lorgue, mm. which is a very lovely uh, region that is filled with rolling hills mm-hmm. and is uh, very famous uh, because it is where a lot of wonderful wheat is grown. Mm. Uh, it's famous actually for the wheat, the quality of the wheat, and it has some very, very lovely ancient villages uh, that are on the tops of hills. It's very pretty because it's not stark. It's not very, very high, but it just has enough relief so that it's very, very beautiful. Yeah. And when you drive there, you go on relatively small roads so you can really appreciate appreciate the countryside, the countryside as yeah, you walk. It's... You really wend your way around these hills and in and out and up and down. And from part of it, as you go, especially if you do as I would do, leaving from Toulouse, you, you take one of these little roads and um, as you're going there, since you're going basically east and slightly southeast, to your right, if you look out, especially if you're on the passenger side, if I'm going and I'm the one driving, you get to see the uh, whole chain of the Pyrenees Mountains. That's nice. And it's really nice. And the only time you wouldn't is in the hard heat of the summer when there's yeah. this kind of haze over yeah. everything. And then, of course, you really don't get to see the outline of the mountains very much. But what we're talking about is an area that at most is about 40, 45 miles from Toulouse. So it's really not yeah, far. Yeah, close, yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the the first place you get to, you pass several little villages that are very pretty. In fact, you pass one that's worth even a little bit of a, a 15, 20 minute stop just to walk around. And that is Saint Félix de Lauragais, okay. uh, which is very pretty little uh, village made out of, uh, the houses are made out of stone. We're already in territory that's no longer brick territory. We're in stone territory that has this beautiful little old chateau. And it has a very little, uh, lovely little square where there's a cafe. So it's kind of a cute stop if you're in the mood to just making a quick stop to yeah, walk around for a few minutes. France has a lot, the Southwest especially, has especially. a lot of places like that where it's great to, you know, park your car, go walk around the center of the right. village for a few minutes, maybe get a drink. Exactly. Maybe go inside of the church if it's open yeah. just to see what you find. And then go again. And then just you go know, again. You right? can spend half an hour maybe and you're Exactly. Done. Yeah. But yeah. it's lovely little scenic stops, happenstance kind of stops yeah. like That's, that. Which is one of, you, one of the nice things about kind of meandering around through the, the, the countryside in the southwest. Yeah. And and so uh, once you get past there, what, what you're doing is you're basically heading for the town of Revel. Oh. Yes, you said it right. And uh, Revel is actually, it's a small, okay, the distinction between a village and town, it, it's got... Um, a little over five. Actually, no. I, I'm looking at my notes. I'm I'm correcting myself. It's actually got almost ten thousand people. So oh. it's it's by French standards, it's actually a small city. Yeah. Uh, and it is it's very very interesting. It is not. Uh, there are two or three things that are really worth stopping for in it uh, to see. Uh, but it's basically a, a town that is not uh, doesn't live off of tourism because it's a place where people go to pick up 
provisions to go further into the mountains which surround it and which are to the east of it. So mm. you enter into the region that's called the Black Mountains, yeah. which is the very furthest southwestern part of this massive area in France called the Massif Central, yeah. which is the huge old mountain area that covers a good chunk on a big map yeah. of France. You can see it covers a big chunk. And, and Revel is really... At the entrance to this this area, it 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 lives off of two uh, kinds of industry. Although a third is developing in the area, uh, one is it is famous and has been for several hundred years for being a place where they make furniture. Mm. And they make very lovely furniture, and a lot of the places that make furniture there now uh, make new uh, copies in good quality wood of old style furniture. Oh, that's nice. French country furniture, you know, all those pieces. It's very famous for its woodworking quality for the furniture making. And uh, you can actually see a lot of it. There's, there are a couple of showrooms and things like that. So a couple of steps up from Ikea. Oh, um, more than a couple. <laughs> Actually, more than a couple. You need a lot more money for a piece of furniture that comes from there than you do. But the other thing that's interesting is because it is at the edge of this Laurigay, which is this wheat-growing cereal uh, crop area, it is, it's the home of a couple of major companies that have uh, good quality and a uh, organic quality uh, cookies and uh Wheat products. Ah, uh, yes. And so like the biscuitery. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, but that are very high end. And so yeah. it's, it's, uh, it's an area that at the, uh, I think a good part of the 20th century was really losing a population. Mm -hmm. And now people are going back to living in places like this because it's young, it's dynamic, and uh, people want to get away from the big cities. And it's not so expensive, probably. And it's not so expensive. Spend, and if you have to go to a big city, Toulouse is not that far away. So it's right, not that right. hard to get to. Right. But uh, from a historical tourist point of view, uh, the main reason for visiting Ravel is its Saturday market, which is this fabulous, fabulous market where all of the uh, farmers in the region bring all of their produce. It's famous for its cheeses. It's famous for its fruits and vegetables. And the market takes place on the central square because it turns out that Revel is a Bastide. Ah. And it's a Bastide, which means it's a, a town that exists since the 1300s built on a grid system with a huge square in the middle. And that has two of the ancient four doorways that entered into the old city mm. that are still there. And it has the largest old covered marketplace in anywhere in southern France. Mm. And it is huge. And the woodwork in it, a lot of it, not every beam, but almost all of it is from its origins in the 14th century. Wow. And it's absolutely beautiful. And when I go... I usually go with my husband who is builder and he loves carpentry and we not only stop so that we get a coffee and go to my favorite bakery and that's what I, the other thing I want to talk about <laughs> is my favorite pastry shop uh, but uh, to marvel at the construction of this incredible marketplace yeah. and it has a belfry. Oh, wow. Which makes it very unusual. In fact, when you uh, look it up, so what was it used for? Like to call people to come to the market? Well, there were two things. In fact, the marketplace, which has all this incredible wood and is covered, uh, in the center of it is what actually was a medieval tower mm -hmm. so that the top part has a clock, which is on the outside. So that's the real belfry part. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but underneath that, in the Middle Ages, was the prison. <laughs> and when the city council found people that were being dishonest, uh, they put them in this little space. It's not that small, but it's the equivalent the size of a small room uh, in the bottom part of this tower, which is in the dead center of this marketplace. And now it's where the tourist office is, <laughs> which is you know, not quite the same thing as a prison. <laughs> no? uh, but what they have on the outside... But almost, almost. Uh, no, come on. Uh, uh, what I have on the outside, and this, of course, is something that used to exist in every city and town in France in the Middle Ages, and you can see with my hands what I'm trying to do. They have the two <laughs> weighing stones that were used because of the grain that was all the, the, the wheat ah, and the sunflower. Yes. So, of course, what they used to do is they would take a huge uh, cylindrical block of stone and they would carve out the upper part so that the volume would be the equivalent of the, the weights. Now, 
in ancient times in France, honestly, I have no idea what the names were for the weights, but let's say in terms of, you know, a bushel, a quart, you know, all of these yeah. different measures, they had I huge stones. I probably learned those when I was going to school, but I don't remember what we called these old I have uh, no idea what they would have called I did, them. I did notice uh, last time I was in Carcassonne a few weeks ago, not that long ago, that a teacher was making the kids measure everything they, they were she was doing an outing and she had the kids had a, a measuring s a string yeah that was like from the middle ages oh really and she was making them measure the width of the lisa ah in carcassonne good for them instead of in meters right. whatever she was doing it with these with these things measure, and then they mm. were going to do math and stuff with it later good idea and i thought oh that's a really good idea that's cool yeah 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 so all you know all of the marketplaces in fact even in toulouse uh that used to be uh it used to be at the place d'escarole where mm. they had the wheat market mm. and they don't the stone the, st the stones are not there anymore. But th these are these massive stones that are dug out on top, and they would pour the wheat in. Oh, so you had a different, like, size? For each wheat, right, grain. exactly. So right. sunflower go in this, and... And, and you know, different qu different quantities, you know. Yeah, so yeah, there yeah. are two of these uh, in front of the tourist office that you can see, so yeah. you get an idea what they look like. And it's really beautiful. The market is fabulous. People come from all over on Saturdays, Really, it's one of it's considered to be one of the best outdoor food markets in all of France, mm. and uh, it is great to go there on a Saturday. Of course, you have to worry about parking your car, but that's you know you just park a little I'm further the away. Queen. It's yeah, okay. you are the parking queen, and uh, so it's a great stop. Uh, you don't have to, and the the houses all around the square are all medieval houses. Mm. So you, some of them is, you still see the half timbering. Some of them you don't anymore, but it's very very pretty. Yeah, and my favorite not my favorite in all places at all times, but one of my favorite, favorite, favorite bakeries <laughs> is there. Because one of the specialties of, of Revel and the area is uh, a, a kind of croustade that they make. Ah, uh, oh God, do I love this mm. stuff. You know, so it's this very beautiful flaky pastry that they fill in with apples. Mm -hmm. But in this place, which is famous, they also do it with lemon, and mm. and other fruits on the inside. And so uh, when we go to go for an outing in this area, my husband knows we have to make a stop there. And for what the, is it called? Do you remember? It's yeah, Now I'm trying to remember. I should know. I, I mean, it, it doesn't matter. I'm sure you could. It's called pastel. It's just ah, called like the like the, the, the plant. The, like yes, it's okay. called a pastel. pastel. Yeah, it's called a pastel. And they and it comes in this kind of funny shape. It's like you can see that they rolled out the dough. It's kind of irregular. I like that. I like the fact so that it's So there's places where they call this is it like le, le pastis du Gers? It's it's a, a little bit like that. Yes, yeah, okay, exactly, okay. you know. But yeah, it's yeah. the pastry is a little bit different and it's a place Believe it or not, this was even so better. It's, it's open seven days a week, which means ah, it's open all yeah. day on Sunday. Because very often when we do go there, it's always a Sunday. And then I always think, oh, and I never remember from one time to the next. And I go, oh, my favorite pastry shop. Oh, it's going to be closed. And, and then it is open. And then it is open. And Every I'm so happy. So and I'm so, isn't that wonderful? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. That's good. But so is the shop called Pastel or is no, the no, cake no. called the Pastel? The cake is called Pastel. But you don't remember where the shop is? N I, it's one of the corners on the market square. Okay. It's one of, and it's, it's, it's right on the corner and I never remember the name of it, but it's literally one of the entrances into the market I'll square. I'll try to see yes, the street see. view will show me. Yes, yes, yes. Mm. Because it's, and it's definitely, and so, and, and so of course I get a whole bunch of stuff when we go there, mm -hmm. which is really bad because... Mm -hmm. You know. Uh, yeah. uh, anyway, uh, Next so next time, stop by my house and share. Yes, <laughs> but you're you're absolutely right. Actually, what happens is I buy it. I have one small piece, and then for the rest of the week, me, my husband who loves it too. By the end of the week, he's saying there's still some left, you know, because I've had one piece, and then I go, oh, I shouldn't eat anymore. Oh, you know. Yeah. But anyway, it's wonderful. And so this is the town of Ravel, which is really in the valley, right before you start climbing up into the hills that take you actually into the the area that's called the Black Mountains. Yeah, la Montagne Noire. The yeah. Montagne Noire. The Montagne Noire, to me, is famous for um, sausages, les saucissons, les ah. things like that, because they have a lot of pigs. and they. Yeah, I think that's closer to the part that's near Castres. Oh, could be. I think so, or in the Sudobre, which is a little bit further... Uh, uh, south, 
Yeah. Uh, I, I, ju I just buy yeah, sometimes right. saucisson from yeah, the Montagne, Montagne Noire. Noir. You, you're, you're right. Uh, but I, it's funny. I don't think of it in relation to this particular zone right okay. around here. And so you, you get on this road that's going to take you up to this, this place that I love to spend the day called saint Fariol. And as you go up this road, you see in a literally a kilometer or two, a little sign that says off to the left, you can get to this village called Sorez. Yes. And so you have a choice. S-O-R-E-Z-E. -E. Yeah. So you really basically have a choice. You can either go there first and then wind up going and spending the rest of the day in saint Fariol, which is basically recreational, or you can do it on your way back. But it depends on the time you arrive and what kind of weather it is. But let me just tell you a little bit about this little village called Sorez, because it's really, really lovely. It's very small. It's a village. It's not a town. Mm -hmm. It's got, um, I'm, I really honestly don't even know, but I'd say it's got a few hundred people. Not much more than that, you know. I mean, yeah. you know, whereas Ravel, of course, has uh, it's already 10, a small 10,000. Yeah. So it's really got a certain amount of industry. Yeah. Um, it's three kilometers from Ravel. So that's a mile yeah, and a half, close. literally. Okay. It's a suburb. It's a suburb. <laughs> no, 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 no. They would not like to be called a suburb. Not at all. Not at all. But uh, unlike Ravel... Uh, which is a Bastide laid out on a grid system and which has a certain flourishing industry, uh, Sorez has now become a, a place of either second residences or an artist colony. Oh. And it's filled with, it's not on a regular grid system. It's mm -hmm. just an old little village with beautiful stone houses. It has a very beautiful tower left from a medieval church. And it has a couple of other ancient pieces like that, besides the very beautiful medieval houses that are very well cared for. But what it's really famous for is uh, a school called the Abbey School. Uh, and what this is, is... Uh, Abbe, comme... Um, Abbe, like it. Abbe. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the town or village was actually founded in the 700s. It's very ancient. Yeah. By the Benedictines. Okay. And so uh, for a very long time, there was a Benedictine uh, monastery there with a very, very flourishing uh, activity because it was, uh, it was considered to be a royal monastery. Mm. Not... It's interesting, the history of all this. In fact, what happened was that uh, a lot of famous... Uh, no, I, I'll go back. I'll, I'll back it up. I'm, I'm getting uh, making it a little bit confusing. Royal children were sent there. Royal young men hmm. were often sent there for a few years because the uh, monks who worked there, who lived there, were very erudite. And so they developed this school that went all through the centuries. And at the time of Louis XIV in the 1600s, it was so famous for being a place that developed thinkers and philosophers that Louis XIV turned it into a royal school. Ah, oh, okay. So it became, and of course, this is for young men, uh, right. of, of, of the aristocracy and of the nobility. Yes. But I think he also did royal schools for young girls, though. Yeah, well, you know what? I don't know. That would be interesting to find I out. I think I heard on one of the um, hit. Sorry, on one of the history shows that I listened to. I think that I he heard, did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe it was one of his mistresses that set that up. Because my <laughs> guess is she, they, she would have been more likely to have said, "Hey, let's do that for girls too." You know, um, but it 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 actually is a. Um, It became famous everywhere mm. because of how uh, important this school Sorez was. was. Yeah. And, so what and was it called? Abbé Sorez? The Abbé, the, the school of the, it's the uh, Royal Military School of Sorez. Okay. Hmm. And uh, it put the little village, which is teeny little village, but absolutely gorgeous, right in the foothills of the mountains on the map. And so yeah. they, they would send all these aristocrats uh, the, in the 1600s and 1700s would send their kids there uh, because it was a very prestigious place for them to, to, to be. Well, as in the case of a lot of other things, the, what happens is that the French Revolution basically closes it down. Mm -hmm. And then... It goes back to being a school, but not being a monastery anymore. Oh, I see. So it became a military academy that was run as a prestigious school. And some very famous people up till today uh, were actually students there. 
Would you believe that uh, Hugo Frey, the song? Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> the song the singer? Uh, singer, singer, and songwriter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He actually was in one of the last classes in oh. the school. So he's in his 60s, I guess. Oh um, no, no, no! He must be 75, 80. Must be 75, oh, 80. Very old. He's but anyway, old. I remember when I went there. I've been there a few times. There's a list of. Uh, in famous the people. famous people starting at the in the 19th century, and of course most of them I never heard of. But I went, oh wow, <laughs> you, you know, you oh, heard you heard of. Yeah, yeah. I know yeah. some of his music and everything. Yeah, uh, it was really that prestigious a school. And then was what happened in the uh, 1980s. It basically stopped being a school, mm -hmm. and they turned it into a museum. Oh, okay. So it's visitable. Ah. And this is the thing that makes it really interesting. Part of the buildings are still the buildings from the time of Louis XIV. So it's beautiful classical architecture. Mm -hmm. It's not medieval architecture. It's just this very beautiful right. classical architecture. Right. You can wander in and out and visit all of the school buildings in this huge courtyard that was once, of course, under the uh, monastery, a cloister that is now just this big, big, big um, courtyard. But um, part of it uh, includes uh, the places you can see where they slept, you can see That's where cool. they studied. It's really, really an interesting place to visit. And one of the last Benedictine monks to ever work there as a teacher became an artist, mm -hmm. and he developed a skill at making tapestries. And he became very famous. And his name is Dom Robert. Okay. And he lived Dom, D-O-M, okay. which was the honorific title for a, a, a monk uh, okay, okay. With, without being the head of the monastery. So that's what I guess they would call okay, them. You know, Dom it's kind Robert, of like yeah. Mr. You know, but this is like Dom Robert. Um, I have no idea what his real name was. Uh, but he became a master tapestry maker. And uh, this is true, actually, even in the Middle Ages, there were artists who, in fact, were monks. There are painters in the Italian Renaissance that were monks as yeah, well. Yeah. And so uh, he lived a very long life. He lived almost the entire 20th century. And uh, he basically spent the second half of his life just creating these most gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous tapestries with these bright colors, totally different than the stuff we've seen, like at the Clooney. You've got purples and yellows and reds. And, oh. and, and they turned a part of the school into a museum for him. So when you go to visit this place, you can actually see there are several big rooms, several big gallery spaces that are devoted to his work. And now it's become a museum space for tapestries so that every once in a while they have another contemporary ta tapestry maker uh, whose work is displayed along with his. That's cool. So it's really cool. And it's a place so, you can visit guided or unguided. Okay. So when, when's a good time to go? I Because you were saying it's an artist colony. Does that mean there are like uh, shows? Or? There are. Uh, there's a little bit of a... No. I don't, you know what? To be honest, uh, in the summertime, there are dates when they have uh, crafts fairs. Okay. So and those I'm not, days are probably yeah, really, those are really go. good. Yeah. Right. There are also uh, little shops. Like there are a lot of ceramicists who live there. Yeah. There's uh, two glassmakers because there's also a tiny little glass museum in the town. Wow. Because one of the histories of the region is that after the War of Religions in the 1500s, a lot of uh, the Protestants went to hide in the forest, in the Black Mountains, and for reasons I don't exactly know, they became glassmakers. Mm. And so they, they're called the gentlemen glassmakers. It's like a whole world of history about people like that. And they would go in, they would live in the woods, and they would make these pieces of beautiful pieces of glass and these stemware and these vases, and then they would bring them down to sell them at these markets. Yeah, we talked about something similar near Mio. Yes, yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. exactly. So there's this teeny little, it's just adorable, it's tiny, it's like two little rooms. This couple took over an old house, and I don't know if they're descendants of one of these families or what, but they... They gather together glass that goes from the like 1500s up through modern times. Oh, that's interesting. And it's a very sweet little two-room museum mm. uh, that's right in the heart of this little village too. So it's a lovely place. So there's a, a little two streets where you have lots of craftspeople. Mm -hmm. You have the little glass museum. You have the Abbey School Museum which has a very good restaurant, excellent restaurant. So it's a great place to have a nice lunch. There's also some other restaurants in this town. So if you want a little hit of culture, 
culture. If you want culture, you it's a lo- <laughs> and the the houses are really beautiful. They're made of this really beautiful white stone. Mm. Uh, very, very lovely. And uh, it, it's a very charming little village to that visit. Good. And you can go there just about any time, except I'd say that probably the dead uh, of winter, things yeah, are closed up. Yeah, yeah of course. Um, most of these tiny places... Uh, they, 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 in the wintertime, they close. Yeah, go go on the weekend. Go, the weekend or like, spring up, and fall. Right, look at the calendar to see if they have... Uh, you know, the city probably has a right. calendar where yes. they announce special events or special fairs or special this and that. And those would be great days to go. But, you know, if nothing's happening that day... You don't want to go because there are painters, there are glassmakers, there are ceramicists. There's, I think, if I remember correctly, even a couple of people who do work on silk and things like that. So it's a really nice craft artist area. And at the same time, a very pretty, very, very pretty little medieval village. Mm -hmm. So it's Mm -hmm. very lovely. It's very, it's small. It's really small. Yeah, I don't think I have ever been to there. I mean, it's not far from here. And no, then, it's not far from yeah. there. And that would get you close to San Ferriol. Yes, it would, wouldn't it? <laughs> yes, it would. You'd think I'm about to torture her. So so you go to, uh, you can actually just do Sorez and, and Revel and avoid going to San Ferriol. Yes, you, but I would recommend that. I would not recommend that <laughs> because especially, 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 now that the weather is nice and into the months of October, going up a little bit more, another two miles up the hills into the area of the lake of San Ferriol is absolutely wonderful. Mm -hmm. And I don't care what you say it is. For people here in Toulouse who do not have the time or energy to drive as far as the sea, it is such a great place to go. And so what is San Ferriol? San Ferriol is a huge, huge, huge lake yeah. that is a reservoir. Okay, it's not the Great Salt Lake and it's not, uh, no. you know. No, but for here, it's a big lake. Yeah. It's a lake that is actually, if I can find pond. this. It's Oh, come on. <laughs> it's. I'm going to tell you how many uh, how many hectares it is in a second. Uh, what is it? it? First of all, one of the reasons I like it, to be, let's really honestly, it's a beautiful lake that's very clean because there's no motorboats allowed on it. You can uh, swim in it, in the water. You can take a pedalo. You can take a little rowboat. Pedalo is uh, uh, You know, where you pedal with your feet a on a, like a little, yeah. what do you call it, a pedal boat? Yeah. Uh, you can take a little, um, you can do a little uh, windsurfing on it because there are I days know. when there's wind. And it's surrounded by forest. Okay, so, yeah. Okay. And it's surrounded by forest. And it is, there are trails that you can use that are absolutely beautiful that take you into the woods where there's some very beautiful waterfalls. And what has happened? And then you can talk about your experience. Yes. But let me finish. The, <laughs> it was created by Pierre-Paul Riquet when he was creating the Canal du Midi. Right. And his brilliant, really masterful idea was to gather up the water that really accumulates in the Black Forest and in the Black Mountains. And the reason it's called that is because there is an enormous amount of rain there, which means that the forest is very, very dense. So from a distance, it really looked very, very dark. And to funnel the waters into these enormous uh, tubes, which take them down, down, literally south and downhill into the place where they were constructing the Canal de Domidi. Right, because you needed to have reservoirs to keep to keep the water enough water at uh, at a good level at a good level. Right. So they took they went up higher around obviously. Yeah, the, the the highest point in this area is a little over three thousand feet. San Ferriol is at about it's about eight hundred meters, which is what it's about. Um, I don't know. Uh, it, 2,000 something feet. So it's yeah. a little high up. It, 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 yeah. It's lovely, but it's not high, high up. But basically what happened was in order Again, to... Again, it's not the Great Salt Lake. No, no, <laughs> but, but, but it's a nice sized lake yeah, and yeah. it is very pretty. But what happened is that they created two reservoirs, one higher up mm-hmm. and they, con- they control the flow right. from that one into this one. And this one has a very big dam. And then it has the the control that that regulates the the flow of the water into the Canal de Midi. And since at a, originally uh, it was simply going to be that, what happened was when the Canal de Midi became so successful, and the reservoir was finished, it really was clear that for people in the area, it was a very lovely, refreshing place to be in the winter in 
in the summer, summer yeah. when it is very, very hot because yeah. it's surrounded by pine trees. Yes. It makes me think a lot of California, actually, mm. because you have the smell of the resin in the trees and then you see forests and the hills in the distance mm-hmm. and it's very beautiful and very calm. And what happened was in the 19th century, apparently there was a project to basically pour concrete everywhere and turn it into to one of these hideous resorts all the way around the lake. Oh. And it, luckily that didn't happen. So the, the, there is a town now attached to San Valle, uh that is largely restaurants and a few B&Bs and a little hotel uh, that are open. There's a, a surfing school. There's a little uh, rental place for boats and things like mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. It weekends all year round and starting in, uh, Easter time, it's open. Everything's open all the time, right through into October. And it, a lot of people go up there are two wonderful, wonderful, really natural campgrounds that are really in the forest that people go to sometimes for a week at a time, but it's a lovely place to go for a day when it's really hot in the city and the water is refreshing, really nice. Yeah. And it's a, it's really people, we go and we picnic Mm -hmm. and we, uh, walk a little bit around, Mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. and it's a really lovely place to go. Okay. So I'm going to tell you my bad, why I have a bad attitude about this place. And it's probably unfair because I haven't been. In 30 years. I'm, I'm, I just turned 52. So last time I was there, I was probably 12 or 13 or something. So it's been a long, long time. A long time. And. The reason why I don't like it much is I have bad memories from there because every summer we would go uh, to the beach. My mom just, even if my dad was still working, as soon as school was out, she would take us and we would camp by the beach. And so I was used to going to the, to the Mediterranean. Yeah. Yeah. Mediterranean is where I went. And one summer, for some reason, we didn't go quite as soon. And so I got signed up to do the day camp. No, it was a, it was an away camp. An it away was, camp? Yeah, but it was just for a few days. It wasn't a long camp, but it was a windsurfing camp. Hmm. So I show, and I'm not a, I'm not a sports people. I mean, I love to watch basketball and I love to photograph basketball, but I can't throw a ball to save my life or do any other sport for that matter. I'm just, I like to walk. That's it. So we go to this place with a whole bunch of teenagers and they wanted us to windsurf. And to windsurf first, you have to get into the water. Yes. And when you're used to the Mediterranean, this muddy, yucky water that I had to put my feet into and sink into made me like it made my skin crawl and then as soon as i could get on the board and windsurf a little bit i would fall off because i was bad at it i was really really bad at it and then i also knew that this is this dam and they kept telling us to not get too close to the dam yeah. because the water you know but i was bad at it you know i mean, Anyway, it was a few days of very strong unpleasantness for me. And so I don't think I'll ever get over that. But I have to admit that if it wasn't for that, yeah, it's it's a fine place. It's, it's really you know? lovely. I, it's a you fine know, place. You really, I'm going to have to take you there to get you desensitized to this traumatic <laughs> experience. I, 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 I just not, found... I will still not step in you, a, a muddy lake. But, it, you know... Par- I'm sorry, I will not. But part... Lakes are always muddier than the sea. I, I know that, yeah. but there is a part of the uh, entrance. The, there's a whole section that's beach. In fact, there are two sides of the beach. I just saw my notes. It's it's a it's a, it's big. It's um, it's the equivalent of about 280 acres. Yeah, so it's a big lake. It's a big lake, and it holds six million meters cube of water. Right. It's huge. Uh, it has a lot of fish. It has. It's really clean now because. They really take care of it because right. this is water that they really want to keep clean. And there's a section now that's close to the part that's the main beach part where it isn't muddy when you go in. It's hard. I mean, it's it's a little bit pebbly, but it's hard. See, I would rather have pebbles and, than mud. And the water is relatively clear. Mm-hmm. And it's nice and refreshing because because it is high up, even though it's not super high up, it never gets warm like it can on the Mediterranean at certain oh, yeah, place, yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, it can be icky water on the Mediterranean in the middle of the summertime, because unless you're out where the waves are 
really breaking. A lot of it just is, is very stagnant after a while. Um, so I find it really refreshing. And I like the fact that it's surrounded by pine trees and forests because yeah, it's not just this little nice. lake, you know, kind of thing. I mean, it just gives you the sense that you're in a lake that's in the mountains. Right. And, and if you wish, because it is possible, there are two or three roads you can take uh, if you are into exploring more, which take you up a little bit higher where you see the other dam, which is really impressive because it's much deeper. It's not as big. The, the, it's not a lake you can go into, but it's a really deep, deep, deep dam. Mm -hmm. And you can uh, wander a little bit. And there are trails in the forest that are actually quite nice. So quite honestly, as a way of getting away from the city. Right, right. And it's being in a place that's very nature uh it's very refreshing. Yeah. It's a really nice place Probably to go. Probably for bikers, hikers, yeah. people like that, it would be very interesting. And really, uh, except for going into a pool with lots of chlorine in the city, unless you have time to get away and go to the sea, right. it's really the best thing that you can do. And it's a lovely place. You can even, on a nice day, even when the weather is not warm enough yet for swimming, it's a great place to go and have some a nice lunch out of doors The light is absolutely beautiful. The reflection off the lake is just lovely. We were there uh, when? We were there, I guess, at the beginning of May. Mm -hmm. And it was a gorgeous, gorgeous Sunday. And the sun was beautiful coming through the trees. And, and we walked yeah. a little bit along the beach. And it was just that kind of nice place to be. Yeah, you know? yeah. yeah. If you're around Toulouse for a little bit, it would be... A good place, and Between, especially if you like windsurfing and the, those types. And if you just activities. like you having a chance to do something that's not village, town, mineral, yeah, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I think that's one of the things. I was just talking to somebody uh, that I work with when I teach, and uh, she's from Toulouse, and she said, yeah, it's a great place to go to get away, you see? Yeah, yeah. Because you feel like you're doing something other than being in a city or a village. Right, you know? and if you have young kids, then probably they would like to just rent a pedal boat and you know yes tool around the lake a little yeah. bit and yeah and lots of people with doggies could take them out there on their leashes to walk yeah because there's a wonderful trail that goes all the way around the lake right uh, and that and probably takes you a long time to walk that it's a good you know i've only to be honest i've gone halfway and then turned back the other way so i'm not even sure but uh certainly an hour at least oh probably that's, more that's not such a big lake then I would say an hour to walk around, but then, you know, when I'm doing that kind of walking, I tend to not walk slowly, you know, so mm -hmm. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. It's a very interesting uh, thing, but that's why I'm saying that as a day's outing, you stop in Ravel, you, you, whether you're there the day of the, the, the market or not, which is a Saturday, uh, you, you take a couple of photos of this absolutely fabulous marketplace. You get your little sweets in this wonderful pastry shop. Yeah. You go and visit Rose Sorez. Yeah. And then you spend the rest of the afternoon relaxing along the lake. And it is lovely, absolutely lovely. And if you stop on the way there or on the way back in the summertime, you know, right where we are, it doesn't get dark till after 10. Oh, yeah, yeah. So you have a nice long summer day. Yes, yes. And you can either stop on the way there or back at San Felix de Lorigue. And it's a, just a lovely excursion it for a day. It sounds good. You almost talked me into oh, it. Oh, come on. I'm going to get you. <laughs> I'm going to put a blindfold on so you, long, put you in the car. So long as I never have to get on a windsurf board again. All Ever right. Again. I, 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 I'll, <laughs> I'll put you in a rowboat. Yeah, I, I can do a rowboat. I can even do a pedal boat. No. All right, let's do a pedal boat. Let's just, do a pedal load together. Just, yeah, just, oh. just no windsurfing. No windsurfing. Oh, I, 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 I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it myself. So why would I ask I you to do it? I wouldn't do it when I was 12 or 13. So how am I going to do it now? Certainly not. <laughs> no. No oh, way. No, no way. No. 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 All right. Thank so, you so much, Elise. Yeah. Well, the next time I'll come up with another day's outing outside of Toulouse. Yeah, these are really good because a lot of people um, who, who listen to the show, they enjoy learning about stuff like that because they might want to come and hang around. And hang know, around, uh, yeah. Because, you know, while. Toulouse is not just a transit stop. It's a place that it's really beautiful. Yeah. It's worth a day just inside the city center. And at then, least. At least. And then well, that's without any museums or anything like that. Uh, and then uh, it's a great base to be, to go out and do all these Uh, wonderful side trips. Yeah. Oh, you know. and I finally went to Aeroscopia. Did you like it? I liked it. Like all those airplanes? I liked all the airplanes. Went so into a Concorde there for my first time in my life. Yeah. Did you go in? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. And the 
it was very fun because I went with um, uh, Nicolas, the, the, the blind guy, and his guide dog. And I don't know if I was supposed to or not, but I I let him touch all the planes, uh -huh. you know, but not all of them. There's too many. Right. But, you know, he got close and he, he was touching the planes right. and feeling around and nobody stopped him. It yeah. was really good. And actually they had displays in Braille right underneath the wing of the plane. Oh, that's nice. So they, so the public is kept off of the planes, but they put a display all in right. Braille right under there. So I'm assuming that it was perfectly okay for him to go. You know, he, he really thought it was very interesting. And I, I liked, to, you know, they were I give them an A plus when it comes to welcoming a blind person and his guide dog. They were impeccable. Why don't we? Impeccable. I, yeah, I'm just thinking as you're saying that we should really just do a podcast on the whole thing of aviation and uh, yeah, and the Airbus history, and, the and, and of, Aeroscopia and all of that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. there's a lot to there's talk about. There's a lot. There's a whole lot here. Yeah, and you can you get to see you know, some of the transport planes. You get right. to walk inside. You see the old cockpits. Uh, you, you see, well, you, you the see. whole history of our aviation and aeronautics. I mean, it's, it's all it's here. all connected to to the history of Toulouse. Yep. Yeah. So one of these days we'll do an episode about That's that. That's a good idea. Maybe next time I maybe do. next time maybe next time I drag you over here. Oh, <laughs> I'll start with the stories of the scandals of the hotel that the aviators stayed in. That's a good way to begin. Ooh, that's a good one. Uh huh. Oh, okay. I got to get this one ready. Excellent. Do that and we'll talk again in a couple of weeks. That's a good idea. <laughs> Thank you very much, Elise. You're quite welcome, Annie. Au revoir. Bye. My thanks to Ruth Fishbeck and Marilyn Hardwig, who signed up to support the show on Patreon this week. Thank you so much for stepping up and helping the show continue Ruth and Marilyn. I'll be sending out the July installment of Lunch Break French in the next few days. It will be all about the Lascaux Caves in the Dordogne. Lunch Break French is aimed at advanced French learner, or at least people who've had plenty of French and they need more practice. Each month, I write an article in French. I keep it around 500 words, and I read it out loud to you. You can follow along in French and English. It's a lot of fun to write, and I hope it's a lot of fun to listen to as well. It's probably challenging because I don't try to make it super easy, but a challenge is good, right? So thank you to all the patrons who support the show month after month. I want you to know how much I appreciate your continued support. And I also welcome your feedback on Lunch Break French. To support the show on Patreon, go to patreon.com forward slash join us. P-A-T-R-E-O-N-J-O-I-N-U-S. And to support the show in some other way, go to joinusinfrance.com forward slash support. Thank you for reviewing the show on iTunes, AB0312, who gives us five stars, who's from the United States and says, lots of episodes about a variety of topics for those interested in France. I have never been, but I'm learning the language and hoping to go soon. See, that's good for me to hear because I'm, just, I'm assuming that a lot of people who listen to the show... No friends, and they're Francophiles. But you know what? Welcome to the people who are not, because we love uh, having new listeners. So he or she, I'm not sure, goes on to say, so I enjoy prepping with this podcast and opening my ears to things about France that I could never learn just by perusing Google or TripAdvisor. Lots of tips for your upcoming Parisian vacation. Annie is warm, knowledgeable, and honest about experiences, places, and adventures in France. I love her interviews with those who visited the country. She really has created a sense of community through the podcast and then with the closed Facebook group that accompanies it. I enjoy any time I get to listen to an episode. Merci, Annie, and merci to you, AB, and then numbers. <laughs> The Join Us in France Travel Podcast is now on iHeartRadio as well as TuneIn Radio. And that means that you can listen to the show with your Amazon Dot. I think I'm not supposed to say the name, but you know, the thing that you summon by saying a woman's name. It starts with an A, it ends with an A. Tell it, tell it. I See, I was good. I didn't say it. 
to get it to work, this is what you say. Play podcast, join us in France. And it will play the latest episode. Now that's pretty nifty. I don't have one, so I didn't test it myself. But thanks to Omar Rodriguez and the other people who tested it for me, that was very helpful. Podcasts are definitely growing in popularity. And if you run across an episode that you think a friend of yours needs to hear, find that episode on the Join Us in France podcast page, the page, not the group, because, well, let me tell you when this again. So, <laughs> so find that episode post on the Join Us in France podcast page and respond in the comment with a tag to your friend. I've seen several of you do that and it works really well. Now, the reason why you have to do it from the podcast page page, not the group, is that I'm pretty sure you can always share from a page, but you cannot share from a group. Oh, Facebook. And, and of course, I've, now that I've said it, they'll probably change that, you know, because they change things all the time. I also want to thank all the people who get in touch with me to offer to record an episode with me about their experiences in France. I have just today, it's Friday today, so uh, I'm off. And just today I've uh, uh, sent three emails out to line up episodes with different people. So thank you very much. And if you want to reach out to me because you've you know, you've, you've done a, you've had a great trip and you want to share about it, uh, connect with me either on the Join Us in France closed group on Facebook, or you can email me, Annie at joinusinfrance.com, or you can call my voicemail number, and that's 1-801-806-1015. Now, don't worry if you call that number. It's not going to wake me up in the middle of the night. It goes straight to voicemail. It sends me a message. I, li I check messages in the morning. And my phone won't even bug me at night. So it's safe to call. So it's 1-801-806-1015. And that's a, a number in Utah. That's where I used to live a long time ago. But we still have that number. On a personal update, we have a lovely seven-month-old yellow Labrador staying with us for a couple of weeks. Uh, he's a future guide dog for the blind. And the family that normally raises him for the guide dog school in Toulouse is on vacation. So we took him in. His name is Mao. Yes, like the chairman, <laughs> Chairman Mao. I'll put some pictures on the Join Us in France closed group. I've now met a lot of puppies via the guide dog school. And I can tell you that the dog's personality makes such a huge difference. I used to think that it was all about how I handled the dog. But that's only really part of the puzzle. I mean, I'm getting better at it because the more puppies you get to handle, you realize, ah, there's a trick to this. They're all kind of the same. Uh, but the dog's personality makes a huge difference. And this one is just so sweet. I'm going to have a hard time giving him, giving him back to his host family. Now, the weather in France was uh, last, the show I put up last week. I told you it was super hot. We had a heat wave. And now it's cooled way off. So we had a, a week-long heat wave where it was really unbearable. It got to, the, to 40 degrees and then above a little bit in some places. It was really awful. So that's 105, which, I mean, that's like Arizona weather, not France weather. This is weird, especially the second week of June. I mean, that was just bizarre. But now it's cooled way off and we're back to the, you know, to the 80s and we even have some rain and, but it'll be going up at the end of the week. The weather is back to normal, which thank goodness, you know, it's all right. That's all for today. Merci beaucoup. Au revoir. A bientôt. The Join Us in France Travel Podcast is written and produced by Annie Sargent and copyright 2017 by Addicted to France. It is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. <laughs>
What was your favorite restaurant on the last Addicted to France tour? On the last tour? Well, I think it was the place that you reserved for us that I had never heard of before, which was the Auberge de de Pont. Yeah, l'Auberge de de Pont. Yes, that turned out to be a really good surprise. Really great surprise. On Ile Saint-Louis, which is, of course, very, very, very chic. And uh, very touristy, and too. And very touristy, also too. Also rich people. And it turned out to be this wonderful, uh, tiny little restaurant where the same person is uh, the the chef, the the uh, waiter, the uh, owner, the owner yeah. uh, does absolutely everything. He's a, he's a wonderful one man shop. I've heard nothing but great things about him. Big guy too, running around in this <laughs> tiny little space, and the food was delicious. There was a really good choice of. Uh, Of first dishes and main dishes, very reasonably priced for uh-huh. the whole thing. The thing is, you have to reserve. You have to reserve. Because it's very small, and he turns people away all the time. All the time. And one of the things that he did, which I really liked, which was unlike a couple of the other places, was that when a couple of the people ordered their dessert of creme brulee, which is a big favorite now. Of course. He, he came over with a little burner and did the burning of the sugar right in front of right us. Right in front of you. you know? oh, that's cool. That's so cool. it was really like, wow, this is really Wonderful. authentic. Okay, yeah. so L'Auberge de Dupont, that's our recommendation. Thank you.